Good morning and welcome to another edition of our PAM uh, Continuing uh, Professional Courses. Um, today, we are really privileged to have uh, Engineer Thie Hiao Giang again with us today. Um, talking about a, a, a holistic approach to fire, to designing for fire safety. Uh, fire safety has always been a, a subject that has been really, really ongoing uh, for a long, long time. And uh, it's really a great privilege for me to have personally known Tae Hao Giang for the last 30 over years uh, in both our pursuit in the, in the contribution to the fire safety industry and into specifically into the designing of um, um, well, into coming up with guidelines and uh, and studies into the design of into the proper application of the design for fire safety. Um, and Jin Tehao Giang is really a very instrumental person. Uh, he's the one who was one of the founding members in terms of bringing in the institution of fire engineers, uh, the setting of the Malaysia branch all those years ago. And currently he is retained as a trustee and a board member of the uh, of the institution of fire engineers. Eh? And uh, for all of us architects, every time we specify a fire rated door set, uh, when we refer to the Malaysian standards, uh, you have to give credit that uh, Engineer Thie Hao Giang is the instrumental person who started the formation of those Malaysian standards and the uh, the format of those standards is now also widely adopted in all the other standards pertaining to fire safety elements. And it is also a, a, a testimony to the uh, to the influence of uh, Engineer Thie Hao Giang that he is an international speaker and he is literally spoken at international conferences, fire safety related international conferences in every single continent on the earth. So it's really, really, uh, truly great achievement. And uh, without further ado, I will hand the floor to engineer Tay Hao Giang. Tay, it's all yours. Thank you, uh, Michelle, for a very uh, supportive uh, introduction. Uh, I hope together, you as one of the uh, final member of IIP, together we can actually make the world a safer place to live. The title of the paper that I'm going to share is Holistic Approach in Fire Safety Design. Uh, if you notice, for those who have been with uh, us for a long time, uh, you notice that now IIP has adopted a new logo. Uh, we have came 100 years back in 2018, and now we're going to move forward for the next 100 years. So the uh, old torch, our logo, is no more uh, what they call modern uh, enough to attract the next generation. Hence, uh, we now digitize the uh, IFE logo uh, with the motto. I'll show you, share with you the motto later on. But the prime objective of IFE is actually help the PSP, professional architects and engineers, to actually be more complete in their design uh, in terms of fire safety design. Our motto is now, the new motto is illuminating a fire safe future, all right? Being a torch, uh, torch signifies uh, risk and danger, but also it shows the light at the end of the tunnel whereby we can actually build a safer habitat. Now, creativity in fire safe safety design in building depends on many factors. Of course, uh, all of us will have to uh, depend on the uh, guidance through uh, building regulations. In Malaysia, we call it Uniform Building Bylaws. But more importantly, I would like to uh, what I call uh, advise all architects to understand the fundamentals and the principles of each requirement and not just follow uh, what I call that the uh, requirement blindly. Now, the moment you cannot explain the, uh, the, the fundamentals of the data given, you don't understand the issue, all right? So it's not just following like a Bible, no. You need to actually following why certain figures were actually enacted in the first place. You need to also read and, and guided 
and be guided by codes and standards because UBBL is only a conceptual requirement. A lot of details actually, like de de design details and all that is actually uh, embedded in the codes and standards that are actually documents that should be read in conjunction with UBBL, not in isolation. You cannot just apply uh, UBBL in design because it's incomplete. And since it's conceptual, it's subject to a lot of interpretation, sometimes according to personal opinions, and it's not facts. So there are a series of local international standards, and you've got to find the relevant standards to follow. In fact, in Malaysia, uh, we have actually uh, developed a series of fire safety standards, uh, some of which are passive. I will talk about it later in the slide. You also need to be updated with the latest news, lessons learned from fire disasters and research findings. If you, if you do not do that, then probably what uh, the information that you had on hand could already be uh, old uh, data, old concept, and at times some of the concepts has already been obsolete. There are a lot of research findings that is very interesting. I'll show, I'll, I'll share with you later on. Need to include human factor in the design. Uh, Grenfell Tower disaster that took seventy two life uh, in uh, London, and uh, there's only there's also another fire in uh, Bangladesh, Dhaka, that took fifty two life in the factory. Flatter factory uh, tells us that uh, human behavior is actually now a prominent factor to be included in fire safety design. Need to understand when selecting building materials based on specifications. Now, when you wanted to build a building, you need actually to specify a lot of uh, fire safety uh, products and systems. Make sure that your specification actually fulfill what you uh, require to be incorporated into the building design, failing which you might get uh, materials or systems that is not fitting for the project. So this one, again, comes back to point number two. It has to be guided by codes and standards on specifications, on the testing, on the installation and maintenance. You need to take environmental and climatic development into consideration because now uh, the whole world is actually fighting to prevent the uh, uh, what they call ambient temperature from increasing more than two degrees C because it's going to spell disaster for humankind. All right. So we need to actually take a look at that. And we need forward thinking mindsets. If you are so engrossed and box yourself in with just following the details in uh, UVBL, you will not progress. Because if you have been doing the same thing over the last 10 years, do you expect any improvement in your work? Of course, you don't. So you need to think outside the box, but is that good enough? For me, where's the box? You should not be actually looking from outside the box. You should have a 360 degree view and that will widen your, your thinking and your perception a lot and you change you into a different person. Essential fire safety engineering fundamentals. What are they? To be able to have a sustainable fire safety design, that is the future. And uh, we are moving very slowly towards this goal. Uh, of course, now the world is changing uh, in UK and the rest of the world because of Grenfell Tower disaster. So to design a building safely, you need to understand the danger of smoke and fire behavior. Otherwise, how do you, how do you uh, see the risk in advance and how do you mitigate the risk? You can't. So you can't just talk about smoke and fire without any understanding. A lot of people talk about that, but if when you ask them about further details, they can't tell you. Fire actually composed of the following uh, elements. It generates heat. Any fire will do that. It also produces smoke unless it's gas that burns cleanly in your kitchen. It also produces toxic gases depending on what type of material, especially synthetic materials. Your needle punch carpet, that is the cheapest, will generate hydrogen cyanide gas that will kill a human within seconds. It also produces carbon dioxide, which is dangerous to human being, and also will generate a lot of water vapor. Now, why does this uh, element 
dangerous because if you look at uh, buildings now, especially a high rise building that houses a telco company, they bring in tons and tons of UPVC cables. When these cables are being burned, they generate hydrochloric acid. When they mix with the water vapor in the air, you imagine you're going to have hydrochloric acid uh, droplets all over the place and it's corrosive. It also impedes escape. And of course, the last but not the least, which is the most dangerous because it also carries carcinogen byproducts, cancer-causing elements in the smoke particles. In America, they find that uh, the uh, fire incidents Statistic has actually come down a lot due to the uh, better protection, better design. And yet, the uh, statistic for uh, firefighters uh, fertility rate has been on the rise. And then they conducted an uh, investigation and find that firefighters, when they go into the fire, their fire suits are all settled with all the uh, dust particles or the smoke particles. Now, when they go back to their stations, when they undress, all these toxic particles are flying in the air and it's being uh, inhaled because they are no more protected by the breathing apparatus. And of course, it will not kill them then, but it kills them one by one years later. So it's very, very important. Smoke particles are actually one of the uh, main uh, cause of uh, fire incident. According to international statistics, close to 90% of the, the fire victims die from smoke suffocation. Lessons learned from international fire incidents. Oh, we have been uh, talking about high-rise buildings that's dangerous and all that. And we have been talking about claddings with the uh, highly combustible polyethylene uh, insulation. Is that, is that all? This particular uh, fire incidents actually is at Bolton uh, University Students Hostel that is below 18 meters. They do not have the polyethylene uh, uh, cladding, but instead they have the high density fiber panel. So anything that can be that can burn during a fire incident, they are all dangerous. So we should not be focused in one area alone. You can see that the, the fire uh, intensity, because these are wood chips, huh, is actually ferocious. How do you how do you uh, what they call assess the intensity of heat release of any fire. There's only four colors, basically. Orange, red, yellow, and white. When you look at a white color for uh, a, a fire, you better start running because they're close to 1,000 degrees C. And that is almost equivalent to a two-hour uh, test fire in any laboratory. The embers of the fire will also settle uh, around the uh, uh, perimeters of the building and over the next building. And if there's anything else that is combustible, you are going to have a fire spreading, a fire spreading on the uh, surrounding buildings. External firefighting, is it uh, effective? You just want to look at, uh, this is a jet of water going to the uh, full scale fire, which I tell you is really too late. but because the water droplet coming out of a jet is actually very, very big or very coarse in terms of diameter. So they are about 1 mm to 2 mm. In diameter, the water droplet is equivalent to a falling rain. And you can see that due to gravity, probably about 30% will be falling to the, to the ground before they reach the fire. You have another probably 20% that is going to be evaporated due to the hot plume of air that is generated by the fire. And of course, if there are any wind, uh, high wind uh, conditions, you, you know that the rest is history. We always were taught all this while conventional wishful thinking that fire can only happen in one location in any building. That is wrong. Has been proven wrong in two uh, fire incidents. The most famous is Lakana House apartment fire, which caused six deaths in UK probably about 15 years ago. The findings were submitted uh, to the parliament and uh, surprisingly, nothing, no action has been taken, which eventually resulted in Grenfell Tower fire causing 72 death. This particular fire, you can see that the fire actually bypassed two floors and go up to, uh, from the, uh, the floor on fire, go up 
two more floors to the, the, the other floors. And at first, the uh, firefighters were actually a bit uh, skeptical whereby could this be arson fire, arsonist fire, which is not actually. It's because of lack of compartmentation. The fire stopping system are not properly uh, designed and maintained. And that leads to uh, fire uh, spreading uh, internally. One of other uh, cases is it happened in Hong Kong, a 15-story uh, commercial building with the three floors uh, below as emporium. And the top and the rest are actually offices. They have a renovation whereby the uh, leaves are all removed and they use uh, bamboo as scaffoldings. That's what happened on the fourth floor. Went into the uh, uh, leaf, lo leaf uh, shaft and went all the way up to 14 and 15 floors. It killed 42 occupants. Okay, so it's, we cannot base on the assumption that fire can happen only in one place, in one building. Next, we're gonna look at the external firefighting versus internal firefighting. This uh, incident actually happened in India. Look at a number of fire trucks at site and uh, look at how the water is being applied. I watched the video of this particular incident and I can tell you it's so sad. People are jumping from the window and kill themselves. It's only how many story? Four story, three story. So lesson learned is that for high-rise buildings, super high-rise, mega-size complex, we must be looking at equipping the building with sufficient internal firefighting facilities. When I talk about that, not necessarily active. If you can have sufficient passive compartmentation, uh, protected corridors, effective uh, fire escape staircases with combined with smoke lobby, you will save, you're gonna save a lot of life. I'm very, very sure. Now, the other day I was uh, involved in the uh, de deliberation in Lincoln. And uh, again, we are talking about how many outlets of uh, wet risers should be in operational for high-rise buildings. And a lot of them, they are, they are, in their opinion, one would be sufficient. So I ask a simple question. Instead of looking at the numbers, should we not look at the water, the water uh, on demand during a fire incident? Maybe you should ask the uh, operation people, the firefighters, how many hoses normally do they use during a fire incident? Instead of we just decide. I think specifiers should not just, designers should not just decide on themselves. You need to do a little bit of facts finding and then only you find that your design is more down to earth, more fit for purpose and more appropriate. What a beautiful heritage uh, building that has been there for hundreds of years and has been the main attraction for Paris. I visited this uh, cathedral a few times and I'm, I'm always admiring the uh, art and craft of the ancient uh, architects. They have a fire is because during a renovation of the roof, uh, the roof, entire roof is made, made of a timber structure while the rest of it is made of stone. And luckily it's because of that, only the roof burns, all right? and cause very little damage to the uh, in internal of the uh, cathedral. But any heritage building that is consumed by fire, even though you can build a replica, it has lost the historical value. For that, we must always remember. And I'm quite sure that uh, uh, Pam has been working with us over the years of how to protect heritage uh, uh, cities like in Penang and in Malacca. There's still a lot of uh, problems. You can see that uh, the roof uh, structure is timber and during renovation, there's not proper uh, fire safety management being introduced. There's no SOP and the, the workers will just do what they want. Eventually, disaster happened and it can't go back in time. Even though France raised hundreds of millions you know, to uh, restore this uh, cathedral, but let me assure you, you'll never be the same again. So this is internally, the roof is burning. Luckily, all these uh, uh, internals are made of uh, non-combustible materials. That's why it survived. Okay, this is another picture showing the roof that's burning with a lot of scaffoldings around. Let me show you how the external firefightings uh, end up, okay? They use a turntable ladder because 
that is the, normally what you do, all right, or the firefighters do. You look at these particular photos, do you think the firefighting is effective? The wind shear factor is so strong, all the water vapor is being blown away without reaching the fire. Look at this. This is a fire, and yet a lot of the droplets drop to the floor, and most of it is being blown away. So to me, if you wait for a fire to happen and try to actually salvage the building, it's going to be a lose-lose situation. To, to have a win-win strategy, you really must incorporate appropriate fire safety strategy on day one and prevent a fire from happening at all. Holistic fire, uh, building design, you need to look at fire safety fundamentals, understanding of the fire behavior and fire safety principle is prerequisite for all building designs. Select less combustible and toxic building materials because if you increase your fuel load, it's imminent that you're waiting for a fire to happen. Fire, design, fire safety design objective shall be life safety. You need to look at occupants, all right? UBBL 1984, codes and standards, compliance does not guarantee life safety or property safety without consideration of all related factors. Don't forget, UBBL only give you the minimum guideline. All professionals will still need to do their own assessment. Sleeping occupancy rates needs further attention. I'll elaborate later. Egress route design should take into consideration of human behavior and people with disabilities. We all uh, look at designing how many exit. We base on floor density and calculate the uh, egress speed. Let me ask you a simple question. If you and your family, you bring your parents and your siblings into a shopping complex and you split into three groups, children went one way, you went one way, and your parents go the other way. During a fire incident, do you evacuate yourself? Or do you stick around and look for all your family members before you get out of the building? So all these factors are not even considered. So how do we plan to get everybody safely out of a building? Egress route design based on floor density should assume half of egress route unusable during a fire incident. And that you have to start looking at the area that is near egress route. Do they have high fuel loads? Are they hazardous? What are the probability of fire happening? If it's very high, then that egress route, apparently, if it happens, if a fire happens, it's useless. Human factors are irrational. We always say that to enable occupants to egress safely from any buildings, you need to have a clear smoke height of minimum two meters. But then we again take the figure for granted because to me, I'm already 1.75 in height. That means the smoke level is going to be about 250 mm above my head. But you must understand, smoke level actually flows along the ceiling is because they carry temperature. By carrying the temperature from the, from the seat of the fire, it could be about 250 degrees C. As it floats along, because of the temperature, heated particles have buoyancy effect. That's why it floats along the ceiling. As it floats along, it actually reduces its temperature to the ambient air. And at the end, if it equalizes, actually, it will then start to descend. So at times, when I talk to designer engineers, they thought, they thought smoke can be controlled to have an even level of two meters. I told them, no, there's another about 100 meters of what they call buffer zone, where you know there's a mixture of clean air and the smoke particles. So when you talk about two meters, you do not have two meters for 1.9. So it would be better if you actually have about 2.5 meters of clear height. This is actually a, a measurement of the temperature in the corridor for firefighters who are fighting an actual fire. You can see that the smoke uh, layers is actually about anywhere close to 400 meters. At their height, kneeling down on the corridor is about 100 and waist level is about 60. Okay, so you can imagine that why now everybody is asked to crawl along if you find that the, the uh, uh, protected corridor is smoke locked because this is where your fresh oxygen is. 
and you must shield yourself from the uh, what they call radiant heat. When the smoke gets uh, too low, you can see the firefighters will have to actually uh, uh, lean back uh, in order to uh, fight the fire. Before that, if you look at these smoke particles, if they're black, it comes out of organic uh, material. If it is white, then it comes out of synthetic material. And white smokes are more dangerous because normally they're toxic. What do people do during a fire incident? Evacuate, fat chance. You know why? Everybody now have a smartphone and they wanted to be a reporter, frontline reporter, okay? And see what happened. This manager while he's trying to fight the fire got to stop people from coming near. Look at what happened. Did people evacuate? No. They stick around, take videos, take photos, and then want to put on their Facebook and all that. Go viral and they become a hero. And no, the world has changed so much, okay? And actually, it happened. All these are actual recordings of what happened in Bolton University Hostel Fire, Hong Kong Underground MRT Fire, and also Pasir Gudang Tank Farm Fire. Instead of evacuating, the students on the Bolton University actually stick around on the top floor of the, the hostel and start videoing the uh, uh, fire incident. As for Hong Kong, it's even worse. The uh, MRT tube is actually traveling with someone who want to commit suicide. So he dosed himself with the combustibles and lighted himself up. When the train stopped at the uh, station, all the passengers get up, leaving the guy that is burning and screaming inside the, 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 the train coach. And instead of evacuating, all of them stay on the platform and take photos. This will impede actually the firefighters coming in, the uh, what they call uh, medical staff coming in to rescue the poor chap. But say go down ten farm fire, which is so dangerous because the tank that is burning generates toxic uh, smoke particles that covers probably about two kilometers. And Pasir Gudang Garden uh, residents all took their car, drive to the, the incident site and watch the fire. So we need to rethink actually human behavior is irrational, all right? Can occupants be alert, alerted by fire alarm signal while sleeping? Definitely no, because your senses is lower. Not only that, what happens for those who, who take uh, who are on medication or go for happy hours? Your senses will be so low. No alarm will raise uh, you from your sleep, especially now if you look at our design, the alarm bells were put at both ends of the corridor before egress into the fire escape staircase. This is an actual incident where I was in the Manchester uh, hotel and I was actually packing after attending a board meeting, packing to come back to Malaysia. And then suddenly I hear this uh, fire alarm noise. This is at the ceiling. Huh? I did not see the light. I was busy uh, packing on my bed. And I thought this is actually the noise coming from a uh, television on ne next room. It took me probably about two minutes to realize that it's a fire alarm. Imagine I'm a fire expert. It took me two minutes. Normal people probably don't, don't even bother if they switch on their television, all right? When I opened the door, I saw a lot of heads pop up the, uh, the, the door. So they look at me, I told them, there is a fire alarm, please evacuate. Do you know, majority of them go back and close the door. So it's not like what we think ideal situation. When the fire alarm, everybody just go, no. And when I went out the staircase, I found that there's a traffic jam. Then I, I looked down one floor, right in the front, that's blocking everybody's access. It's actually an obese woman on clutch, assisted by a uh, hotel staff. So two of them occupy the entire width of the staircase. So you see there are a lot of uh, ideal, ideal uh, or what they call ideal design doesn't apply in actual uh, practical case, all right? Apply a uh, passive fire safety design. I think I have actually raised this uh, for quite a number of years and I think it's still happening on the market. A lot of architects now are design a uh, supermarket, hypermarket, like Parkson, because they do not want any compartmentation. So they actually uh, use uh, big size, extra huge size uh, roller shutters. 
20 feet by 10 feet for compartmentation when there's a fire incident. But if you look at UBBL, any opening in a, a compartmentation wall, if you, if you actually uh, choose a fire rated system to close up the opening, you should not only maintain the integrity, you should also maintain insulation. How many times I see only a single layer of uh, large scale fire roller shutter being installed in so many mega size shopping centers. This is actually uh, the architect will need to make sure that roller shutter that you specify and they are installed in your project should also pass integrity and full insulation criteria. This is actually now mandatory uh, from a uh, circular coming out of uh, fire rescue department, but it's really clearly stated in our UBBL. So it's not whether you can get on the market, it, 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 there's always a demand and supply issue. But if you are still looking at cost, my advice is don't put in anything, you save all the money. Let's look at geometry of windows in relation to flame behavior. If you have a fire, if you design a window, long and uh, elongated, you're gonna get uh, what I call a fire size that is gonna be very much smaller, even though the office volume is the same. And also the, uh, the uh, uh, what I call that, the growth of the fire will be prolonged. But if you were to design a window of a higher height than the width, then of course the fire size is gonna be very much bigger because now you're gonna have a ventilation control fire whereby when, when you have a fire, the uh, hotter gases will evacuate or escape through the top of the window. By this time, the, the glass or whatever will have cracked. At the same time, when the hot gas actually are running out, you will also induce a cold air from coming in. So if you have this kind of window, it's limited uh, uh, what they call uh, convection current flow. So the, once you have limited oxygen coming in, of course, the fire size is going to be very much smaller. Okay. So in fact, you can actually introduce fire safety design through design. Let's look at the protected corridors and actually halls and all that. If you use actually a good uh, fire resistant ceiling, you find that the heat, when it, the heat generated by the uh, uh, fire uh, where the smoke layer is flowing along, the heat will be re reflected forward. And that actually aid in fire propagation because temperature has normally heat up uh, materials and then the fire will then start once it achieves flammability uh, for the core stage. But if you were to uh, use a ceiling that can absorb, that is absorbent in heat, not entirely but partially, then you find that the heat reflected will then be greatly reduced. So a lot of the design can actually be introduced to actually reduce uh, fire risk in the building. You've got so many materials, and if you look at thermal conductivity, okay, brick is actually the best because it's solid, and uh, you know if you hit up one side, it will be uh, uh, transmitted. Especially if your what they call your houses, your bedroom is facing uh, what they call the the uh, west. You find that nighttime you cannot sleep; it's so hot, and air is the best. All right. So when you pick, let's say, uh, internal interior finishes, I know polyurethane foam is very cheap and plasterboard is more expensive, all right? But if you look at the insulation property of polyurethane foam, fits the conservation of energy, which probably will get high mark in green building index, but then it's highly combustible. So when you are thinking about green building index, you've got to actually factor in the, the combustibility. Anything that is burned definitely is not green because it, it increases a carbon footprint. All right. How to prevent fire uh, spreading from uh, floor to floor? If you have window size again of this nature, the fire will then leap from floor to floor. All right. But if you have a square window, it will normally be deflected from a building surface. Ah, but that's a catch. 
the moment you put in a cladding system on the surface of the building, you are now forming an external chimney because the flame is no more be able to be deflected from the surface of the building, but it's going to travel in between the cladding or the curtain walling and the building. All right. So let's look at, these are all research data, huh? uh, but there are a lot of things that you have to uh, find out about the combustibles inside the, uh, the building and all that. So you cannot just copy, as I said, as I said earlier, all these, you need to actually study the, 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 how the experiment is being conducted and all that. So if you have a bigger window, you can see that uh, the flame size is actually bigger, broader, and still you have the same effect, uh, square window, uh, this is uh, what they call that a rectangular window. And we have now a lot of curtain walling system. Uh, you can have curtain walling system or external cladding. Make sure that the fire, proper fire barrier system that is tested and approved be applied on floor uh, areas, positions, compartmented floor, and the cladding. It has to be actually provide a fire stopping seal to prevent a, a fire spreading. Of course, if you design buildings of this nature, you are not worried about whether fire can spread from floor to floor because it curves away, all right? So each of these floors, whenever a fire is saw into the sky, the fire is going to be, the flame is going to be, uh, you know, uh, discharged into the sky and it will not affect the rest of the building. So there are many creative, uh, building design that you can actually incorporate to actually eliminate the uh, possibility of a fire risk. Don't you think it's beautiful? Nighttime, you, you know, it, it gives you, instead of a square building or it looks very monotonous, if you design building like that, you have curvatures, you've got their beauties, creativities that's been built into a design. I love uh, architectural buildings because I studied a lot of them uh, over the years. So fire safety design specifications. Fire doors, I always love to talk about doors because it's a critical element in uh, egress as well as, as compartmentation. And how many architects actually read MS 10 symmetry? I think there are a lot of Malaysian standards. Uh, if you haven't got hold of a copy, my advice is that better get one a copy and then start reading, all right? I recommend one very important one after this. So, until you understand how doors are tested, how do you do specifications? I wonder. The iron mangrove specs, installation procedures, testing and commissioning. Do you know doors are supposed to be tested before they are handed over? Because your door closer are supposed to be adjusted. There are two screws on door closer. They are supposed to be adjusted for two forces. One is the closing moment. And once they are reached about four to six degrees before they are totally closed, there is another force created by the uh, a door closer to push harder so that the door and the lock will latch and form a fire barrier. But if you just let the contractors install the doors and don't even inspect, are you sure that by nine months time, the door is still uh, a fire rated door? We have actually do a lot of surveys on the market and I can tell you some of the new projects within nine months, the doors are all gone, okay? For doors, I can even have one paper or two papers by itself, including M. Mangris. So we have, under my technical committee, Fire Properties of Building Materials, we already developed seven or eight Malaysian standards, of which three are actually specifically for M. Mangris. All right? Failure of door will compromise compartmentation and egress route. So without doors, you just don't have anything. And don't forget, fire escape staircases, You've only got two for high-rise buildings. Each on each floor is guarded. The integrity of the fire escape staircases are guarded by fire resistant door set. If the door fails on the floor on fire, you forego, you forego the, the uh, integrity of the entire staircases and nobody escapes, okay? Means of escape design. I like to talk about this because these actually are the lesson we learned from 911 where twin tower collapse. Bylaw guidance says that the separation of two fire escape staircase should be not should be more than five m, uh, five meter. In this case, if you design a uh, uh, back to back staircases, 
or scissors staircases, you actually qualify because the distance from here around the thing to here is five meters or more. But you've forgotten. You're putting two uh, what they call life safety uh, features in one location and into one common corridor. So if there's a fire and the fire gets into this uh, protected corridor, you compromise both fire escape staircase. Okay? And in 911, of course, the uh, uh, explosion uh, due to the aircraft uh, took out three floors of the fire escape staircases. And the people, the occupants uh, in the 911 uh, Twin Towers did not realize those above the floors that is being crashed by the aircraft, they are already dead, okay? Until the building collapsed. So this is a more, <coughs> what they call, better approach where the floor exit actually enters into two separate uh, fire escape uh, staircases uh, that is uh, clearly a space apart so that at least you go alternate uh, fire escape staircase. And of course, uh, for those that have fireman's leave, you actually uh, will have uh, what they call, you must have a smoke lobby uh, so that when the firefighters uh, came out onto that floor, they have to actually regroup before they enter the floor and they are protected. But the, for pressurization, the staircase pressure should be 50 pascals higher than the smoke lobby. And the smoke lobby's uh, pressure should be 50 pascals higher than the protected corridor. International Commerce Center, now they are looking at refuge floor design. All right. Uh, in the, because after studying the human factor, uh, it was discovered that it's impossible for residents, I'm talking about even healthy uh, people, to actually evacuate, let's say, 118 floors, all right? So that is, that is, is impossible. Uh, so for every 25 floors, they will then build in a refuge floor where the people who are tired can actually rest before continuing their journey. I was taken for a technical visit of this particular uh, uh, high-rise. And uh, what happened is that the, the designer, my IP friend in Hong Kong, Yang Wong, uh, is very, very proud in showing me the refuge floor. And I asked Yang a question. I said, okay, fine. People who are tired, normally you let them rest here, sit down on the floor, very nice. I said, but if you understand human, once they are tired, they sit down, they'll never get up. I said, then what are you going to do with all these people? Who is going to manage them? He said, firefighters. I said, firefighters for no time. Their, their task is to fight the fire and search and rescue. And to manage, let's say, a few hundred people on each of these floors is virtually impossible. You can see that there's refuge floor one, two, three. So people coming down, tired, can sit around here. And they are very clear uh, signage, which is very good. The floors are all clear and clean of any uh, combustibles. Uh, no air conditioning because at that height, you do not need air con and uh, nothing is combustible. All the steel structure are protected. You can see that. And they also have this uh, sprinkler system here to try to form a water curtain. I also asked Yang Long a question. I say, if you got a fire below and the hot plume of smoke is coming up, how do you prevent the smoke from actually being uh, blown into these refuge floors? Uh, if you are installing the spray system here, by right, they need to be tested in wind tunnel. Okay, sorry. So it's not just a, a perception or an opinion that, you know, if I do this protection, it's going to work. No, you still have to be verified. All the, uh, what they call, models, all the uh, assumptions need to be verified. Means of escape is very important because now for high-rise buildings, uh, I think I do not think we should do mass evacuation. I think we could look at phase evacuation, special group evacuation, and also evacuation using high-speed lift. Because I can tell you that even, even the youngsters nowadays, they are not that healthy. I have actually uh, proof for that is because I'm very active uh, in outdoor activities. Uh, I've led youngsters in climbing Mount Kinabalu three times during the last six years. Uh, at my age, you can imagine, I still outclimb the, a lot of the youngsters. So it, it proved my theory, all right? 
So not many people can actually walk down straight, let's say for even 60 or 80 floors. So perhaps we should actually revisit the mass evacuation strategy to see that do we need really to evacuate the whole building. Of course, uh, there are other considerations. You need to have a very uh, robust evacuation program. You need uh, emergency uh, planning. You need emergency management. The software part of it must come in, all right? to uh, support the uh, concept or the strategy. Special group definitely need to be uh, evacuated. Uh, uh, what they call that? Uh, they, they need special attention that people like uh, obese, senior citizens, children, uh, pregnant ladies, people on clutches, people with uh, serious disease, people with disabilities. They should be pre-identified, group up, and then brought in to the uh, uh, smoke lobby where you have a firefighter's leave and evacuate by leave. Okay. Theater design, if you look at the picture I put down there, when you design theater settings, please do not just look at density. You can put so many people inside there so they can get a, a better ROI. No. When people are seated, there should be enough space in between the rows for, for whoever that's going to walk uh, from the aisle into the seats. This is crucial is because during a fire, you're looking at evacuation. So there must be enough space for people to actually move freely, okay? International fire incidents and lessons learned. What are the uh, fire risks in modern buildings? External firefighting can only reach 10 story or 30 meters. Uh, I'll show you in the, in the photo later, but this is true because you can't, to have, you can't design fire pumps to pump up 20, 30, 40, 60 story, impossible. So any, any high-rise building, according to UBBL, uh, that is above 30 meters, you need to have sufficient internal firefighting facilities. Okay? Probability of fire incidents increase with synthetic combustibles. Ah, where does it come from? You can design the best compartmentation and all that, but when the interior finish, uh, interior deck uh, designers come in, they will start uh, what they call equipping the entire building with uh, interior finishes, many of which are highly combustible. And so far, this, this particular area, they are not regulated. Maximum travel distance exceed that for me mega shopping complexes. Some of the mega shopping complex that I go into, I, I also are wondering why the cloa sign that's put up so high still remain the same size. You at least can put two or a bigger size so that people can see them clearly. And some of them are actually put it in a very uh, ambiguous situation, or by you, it's, you, you, can't, you could hardly find them, especially if the, the uh, shopping centers have curvatures. It's no more like last time, block form, square, or rectangular. So if you go to the largest shopping, mega shopping complex in the world, the second largest is in Dubai, which I visited, I can tell you, you need a waste inside there to get out. Everywhere looks the same. And there's hardly uh, any uh, exit signs. Building regulation prescriptive are out of date and not fit for purpose. Many of the clauses in the UBBL. So you cannot be just holding onto that book and hope for the best. Because if you do that, it's going to be good luck to you. Okay? Code and standards development is behind building industry material development. It took two to three years to actually develop a, a code and standards. And I can tell you that uh, the uh, beauty industry, uh, development of new materials is definitely so much faster. Every single day, there are new, new systems, new materials, many of which are not tested. There's no historical data. Uh, there's no, uh, what they call, uh, data to prove that in the X number of years time, it's still going to behave the same. Laboratory small-scale testing does not reflect uh, construction application. For example, external cladding system. You test so small piece of sample for surface spread of frame where there's no fire involved. It's only a radiation panel with a, with, with a pellet light there. And by the way, cloud rating is still combustible. Unless it's totally non-combustible, for those who are combustible, you go for uh, BS476 part 7, you test for surface spread of frame to achieve cloud so It is still no good because it's still burned. And a lot of them, a lot of the manufacturers, what they do is they put a piece of uh, very thin piece of uh, what they call aluminum in the front and you pass the test. But what is behind? 
And if you leave a cavity, do you put in also, incorporate also a fire stopping system? So the whole world is changing, all right? I'll show the, the uh, Malaysia already, uh, uh, what I call, moving ahead, uh, in, in, uh, ahead of many, many countries in the world by adopting full scale test for external cladding. Human behavior factor is missed out on fire safety design. RSET not realistic for performance based high rise and all that. RSET actually refers to required safety grace time. Formula is that uh, how they arrive at the required safety grace time duration uh, to determine uh, safety of a person that can evacuate a building uh, during a fire incident is detection of a, a fire by smoke, uh, by smoke detectors. So probably they look at about half a minute. And then from a detector to raise the alarm, another half a minute, so one minute. And then they will say that, okay, the reaction, a perception of the smoke alarm signal by occupants may be about two minutes to three minutes. Then you, they will then assign another factor, assuming that after you listen to the alarm, you take you another two or three minutes before you decide to move. But if your boss says, I will need the report before 12, and the fire happened at 11.40, you know the answer, otherwise you'll be sacked, okay? So after you decide to move, then you still got to add in the total traveling time from 60 floor all the way through the staircase until you get out the final exit. That assumption is not realistic because as I say, listening to uh, what they call fire alarm signal detection, uh, listening, that means you, you are aware that the alarm is going on, uh, it's already a lot of question mark there, and uh, deciding when to leave or not, I really say before. 85% of people ignore fire alarm, unless it's a drill. Okay? So we need to actually relook at a lot of factors. I'm not even talking about uh, uh, buildings uh, that is uh, headquarters for the death, where, where one of the engineers still design a uh, fire detection alarm system according to uh, codes and standards. I say, who can hear your alarm? They're all deaf. You understand what I'm saying? So are we putting a cut before the horse of just uh, throwing in a system that comply with the regulation and the uh, codes and standards and without looking at eventually, is it going to help the occupants in evacuation? Are we really designing safe buildings? Or are we just designing as a matter of call for completion of a, a piece of work? your daily, daily routine. I think uh, I would like all the uh, uh, participants to actually go back and start thinking about that. Without understanding of fire safety engineering, the design is incomplete, okay? Graphic tower, okay, look at the, uh, the, just now I talk about high-rise building, you got to go internal, is because you look at the firefighters uh, jet, of, they can only reach 30 meters. Beyond that, you're on your own. Even though they use turntable ladder that can reach higher, I reach you so many uh, uh, slices of the slide that it might not be working. Okay, so this building catches fire. Middle East, Australia, China, all the same because of climatical conditions. Conservation of energy, green. In the UK, it's very, very cold. So to reduce the heating bill, because they got to heat up the apartment, whereas in Malaysia, we put aircon to cool ourselves down as in, in, in Middle East. So how to, to prevent heat loss or heat entrance enter into a building is by having good insulation material. And the cheapest is polyethylene. Six inches of polyethylene resulted in 72 people die. Best of all, the court case revealed that actually the manufacturer test this system failed and they concealed the fact while introducing this product onto the market. So as an architect, it's your responsibility to actually do your spec correct. Not only that, you also want to check the products that's being given to you, the samples, not only the samples, but the actual product that's eventually landed in your project. Are they the same? Or what is being shown in your catalog is only a photo, while what appears in your project site is something else different. So the vigilance of uh, professionals is very, very important, all right? Because that comes back to competency of a professional. Now we are looking at so many timber high-rise buildings coming out in Europe. Oh my goodness, 22-story, 24-story. 
they keep convincing or try to convince the market that it's safe. Timber building is safe. Imagine, uh, column, beam, fire escape staircase, flooring, everything, walls, all timber. CLT, they have uh, engineer timber and all that. And they argue that the chairing rate of a timber is so much better than steel structure. I totally agree. They did so much research on the fire test of timber, cross uh, timber beams and all that. Load barrier and no load barrier. When I ask a simple question, there's no answer. I say, did you ever test the smoke index and the byproduct that comes out of the materials that you design in terms of intensity and what's the impact on the human occupants? Nobody do that. And they declare that the timber high-rise building is safe. I rest my case. There are a lot of changes in code and standard and laboratory testing. Okay, now in uh, uh, Malaysia, we follow this particular orders. Uh. Uh, if you want to adopt an uh, international standard, we need to look at ISO first. And then we look at regional standard, European norm that consists of 28 countries. ISO consists now of uh, whole world. Then the next level, if we cannot find anyone in the above two, we look at the uh, nation standard, national standards, like nation standard, British standard, Australian standard. Anyway, we can forget about British standard because they have now uh, going to review, they're going to review all their standards after the Grenfell Tower. GP is China, Kopia. Industrial standards will be the last. You look at NFPA, factory mutual, underwriters, laboratories, ASTM, and the rest. One word of caution is that I've actually met a lot of designers, professional engineers. They say, oh, I follow my design, uh, NFPA design. So the question I ask is that, did you follow the entire uh, conditions in the standard or the criteria or the requirement in the standard or you just take one part? They only took one part. I say, no, that is wrong. If you want to follow A standard, you follow the entire standard. They have requirements. They have a test methodology. They have a lot of things inside that you just cannot pick the part that actually uh, is a, a, a easier solution compared to Malaysian standard or compared to uh, what is required in the rest of the world. And then, of course, we've got Fire Services Act 341 that is uh, enacted for occupied buildings. Huh? So this particular standard, I think uh, all the uh, architects should actually take a look and engineers as well. It's called MS1183, published in 2015. I'm heavily involved. Uh, this is actually, uh, we adopt the uh, BS9999. It's called Fire Safety in the Design, Management and Use of Buildings School of Practice. It's about one inch thick. If your pillow is not high enough, you can put underneath. I hope all the information go into your brain. I like it is because this is the first standard that explains everything inside so that you understand why you do this, why you do that. And not like other standards, they just tell you, do this. Take this figure. No. Inside here, inside this standard, there is actually educational, it's an educational document. It's expensive, but then uh, it's very good to provide an uh, architect with a lot of guidance. post Grenfell Tower disaster, external cladding class O did not reflect two results of site application, so it's gone in Malaysia, okay? So for all claddings, you now has to be tested to BS8414, part one and two, full-scale external test. By CIRIM and uh, this uh, joint uh, effort by CIRIM and FRDM. And it's very interesting. UK now also is currently reviewing the document B building regulation that's equivalent to UBBL because it cannot hold water anymore. Uh, there are so many uh, loopholes inside there. And all the time we thought that, you know, we should look towards British standard. We should look at uh, UK as a model. That, that uh, perception is gone. Okay. We are now looking towards ISO and EN, and there are a lot of uh, things that actually has come out of the uh, court proceeding. Phase one, phase two, now it's phase three. It's horrible, okay? It's horrible. If you've got time, you can actually log in to actually go into LinkedIn. You can listen in, and you can find out a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, misperceptions and wrongdoings. DSM, actually now Department of Standards, now actually uh, nominate... Uh, a representative to actually represent Malaysia in ISO TC92 subcommittees. So they have, uh, at the moment, we're involved in subcommittee one, two, three, four. 
I'm nominated to actually sit in uh, one, two, and three. Uh, I leave uh, four to others. It's because all the fire safety engineering uh, approach and the uh, uh, classification, uh, the methods they use will have to come from one, two, and three. It's very, very important that you need to understand fire initiation and growth, fire containment, which now I'm a participating member. The rest of it, we are still on uh, observer. Observer means that you cannot be involved in the uh, discussion, but you are eligible to vote vote for the draft. And the SE3 is very interesting. It's fire threat, not threat, sorry, threat to people and environment. And I think these uh, areas will then eventually, I would like to share with the practicing architects. And every time, the first time I attended the meeting uh, online, I can tell you it's fantastic. The, none of the uh, experts that actually is involved in the draft use assumptions or perceptions or opinions. All the data are backed up by intensive research and it has to be agreed by everybody because there are so many uh, uh, experts inside there. Okay, so we, you, you can't just assume things. Uh, this is actually external cladding now being tested in Malaysia. This is uh, an opening, opening of the uh, BS8414 uh, test in Sirim, uh, uh, where I was invited. And you can see a lot of the stakeholders are all invited. Now, what I would like to comment about this particular standard that needs to be improved is that there is no opening above. In fact, they should have another opening above to indicate window. So there should be another window opening to see whether the flame actually uh, intrude into the floor above. Uh, this standard was actually uh, developed uh, by UK. Uh, now Australia also practice that. NIP also they have one, but not as uh, complete as BS and AS. Uh, there's also few other criteria means that uh, the cladding should not uh, have debris uh, falling from the surface onto the floor below. And they are looking at the, uh, uh, what they call it, the temperature. They should not exceed 600, 650 degrees C at their second thermal couple. So innovative future design, uh, I do not know. I, I rest my comment where, you know, Dubai is one of the, the heavily uh, invested uh, city in the world where they have this futuristic, so-called futuristic condominium. How do you like it? Press the button. You can change your, your window view or your, your balcony view. Uh, but then how do you define whether it's north, south, east, west during evacuation? I don't know. This architect is fantastic. It incorporated a, a, a green design whereby the building rotates according to the, when the wind builds up to collect energy for the uh, usage of the building. But again, uh, they are, there are a lot of areas that we still need to look at, all right? For firefighting, for also you've got more mechanical electrical system to move a building of this scale. Oops. The building still turned up. Huh? Okay, together, uh, let's put our hands together to make the world a civil living place. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you, Engineer Tay. Thank you. Um, we, uh, we don't know how to give you um, um, a virtual <laughs> applause. There's no sound, no soundtrack. Okay, no need, no need. No virtual applause soundtrack. No yeah. yeah, if everyone can show their appreciation by putting on the uh, the icon with the clapping hand, that would be great. <laughs> okay. Okay, great. Uh, well, thank, thank you so much, uh, Engineer Tay. Um, it is uh, always, always very, very enlightening. Uh, when, when, whenever you speak, it gives us such great uh, depth to 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 the whole industry, uh, to the to the whole fire safety, to this whole topic about fire safety in design. Uh, I've always said that uh, for us as practitioners, we always refer to the UBBL as our starting point when we do our designs. 
but unfortunately, the UBBL is also the ending point in our design. We don't explore any further from the UBBL. Uh, it's, um, I've always related this to the analogy of us uh, getting our driving license. When we get our driving license, we study the undang undang, uh, what jalan is it? The uh, whatever you call it now. You answer a few objective questions, and you get uh, you get eighty marks out of the hundred objective questions, and you pass that one. Okay, you you get your driving license yeah, after your driving test. And um, I always say that uh, referring to the UBBL is almost like saying that. Once you've learned the undang undang jalan, you're now an expert driver. Um, the road laws say that uh, your maximum speed on the highway is 100 k's an hour. So you drive at 99.5 k's an hour, perfect, you've complied with the law. But in the heavy torrential rain, uh, you at 99.5 kilometers an hour, you're still driving within the law, but uh, you're an endangerment to everybody. Yeah, if you're driving in the torrential rain you know, your car will be sliding all over the road and uh, now you'll be a danger so i think that uh, <laughs> probably is what i'm going to say but anyway the show is that uh, they today uh we um we have seven questions in the q and a and we have one question in the chat box uh, so tell you you able to access the q and a right yes yeah okay per perhaps you can just run right through it uh, since there's seven of them uh, um let, 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 let's start with it. Okay, um, the first question on the Q&A from Ham Ping Hing. How do we advise UBBL bylaw in Malaysia to improve the fire safety system in Malaysia? Uh, basically, uh, you do not have to actually uh, go into the uh, UBBL. As I say, professionals are supposed to be creative. Not only that, all the professionals, engineers, architects are supposed to be the solution provider. Why are we looking at a piece of document? That is only telling you that these are the things they need to do. How do you improvise it beyond the boundary of the UBBL will depend on individual uh, designers, isn't it? That's why I, I keep saying that many, I find that many of the uh, uh, professionals are trapped. They are trapped in that document so deep and at times, conceptually, they are not even clear. I've actually discussed with someone and I was actually taken aback when cladding was actually described as external wall. I said, hang on a second. If you check dictionary, cladding is a layer that is actually covering something else. That's why I say clad. Clad, you see, simple English is, is that. So I say, if, if you go back to... Uh, Oxford Dictionary, and you understand the fundamental, how can cladding be uh, what you call uh, described as external wall? You can't. So I think if you look at uh, what I've been talking about, you've got to establish fire safety design conceptually first before you look at the detail. That's the whole gist of my paper this morning. But if you start off with UBBL, you are again putting the cart before the horse. How do you design before you even understand what risk you are getting uh, uh, involved? You see, that is always my, my point. You have to actually understand the fundamental. This has always been taught by teachers in secondary school. When in doubt, go back to fundamentals. All right, so UBBL is actually, uh, to change that, we've got to go through parliament, and I can tell you it's... it's, it's uh, uh, it's a long process. It's a long process and to go through AG chamber, you're going to go through a lot of things. And until now, we have actually very sadly only changed cosmetically only. The fundamental of the whole UBR still did not change. It still deemed to satisfy. And not many uh, professionals realize that it's actually the minimum requirement. It's not the, uh, it may not be the appropriate requirement. So at times, you follow the guidance, of course, you need those uh, guidance. Like if, you, if your area uh, for factory is more than 2,000 meters square, you need a sprinkler system. We are one of the best protected country in the world. Yes. So those are only what you call that uh, uh, 
guidance, but if can reduce the risk so much, then perhaps the sprinkler system is on the standby. So it's not just following strictly to a guide. You've got to think, you've got to review, and uh, I would like to advise all the architects that you need to actually keep thinking. You see, nowadays, I find that a lot of professionals, they don't think anymore. They just follow. So what is the difference between a club and a professional? You tell me. If you don't start thinking, you don't use your brain. And then, worst of all, a lot of them, they learn from their sifu. So when you learn from your sifu, uh, and you don't check, you know, so forever, if the concept is correct, fine. If the concept is half cooked, imagine that concept will be passed on generation to generation. And then we are all in a do drum. And I can tell you that we have been very lucky. There's no major incidents here. One of these days, believe me, there will be a major incident. But why should we be waiting for that day to come? We have seen enough around the world. We professionals in this country should actually start to actually pull out our socks and make it safe so that hopefully no incident will happen or should it happen at least the damage is kept to a minimum can we look at the uh, second uh, question good to think outside the box but our local bomba officer just flow the book blindly due to the level of academic knowledge and competence see checking officer review committee either do not understand thing out of the box and refuse that will prove an innovation approach what is your advice overcome this approval hindrance? Uh, this is, there's two sides to this story. Uh, I have been uh, listening to their side of the story and there are a lot of complaints from their side that architects, many architects uh, submit the plans, don't even follow their guidance, uh, leaving a lot of areas for them to fill in, okay? Now, if you look at our current system under CCC, all the designs are actually the uh, prerogative and the responsibility of the PSP. On the other hand, the fire officers are supposed only to look for UBBL uh, compliance. They should not be looking into your uh, design aspect. But of course, you cannot. You, unless it's performance-based, you cannot uh, make a decision to omit something that's required under the bylaw. Okay, that, that, is, that is very, very... Uh, I think the boundary has been drawn quite early on. This, this, this concept has been going on for probably about, I think, 15, 20 years. But yet, a lot of the uh, professionals that I talk to, they are still telling me Bomba approved. I say, excuse me, hello, look at the plan. Last time is the Lulus Khan, now it's the Sakan. Acknowledge receipt of your plan. You are still responsible for all the designs, passive designs. Well, the engineer are responsible for all the active designs. So I am not sure what is the... Uh, uh, before I carry on, uh, let me tell you first. There has been a structure, restructuring of the fire and rescue department, or what you call BOMBA, in Malaysia. And we are working very closely with the uh, uh, Ketua Pengara, who is our president. And I can tell you this, the new batch of the officers are very, very, uh, uh, what I call, knowledgeable. All right? A lot of them, they have degree, and some of them even have doctorate degree. So I do not know... Uh, Mr. Kim, I don't know who you talk to because it's, your answer is very generous. Uh, if you want, probably you can then, after the uh, what, you can, you can then discuss uh, separately. Okay. My phone number is 012-886-229. Right? Okay, WhatsApp today. Uh, yeah, okay. Take Everyone what, um, uh, flood up his phone with WhatsApp now. <laughs> No All problem. Right. Uh, our, our, I have an auto, auto filtration system. <laughs> Don't worry. Uh, lately, we are seeing high rise with so many decorative fins that snakes up and down the entire height of the building. Can we argue that those decorative fins are not cladding and as such not subject to the fire testing clearance? Imagine just how those lengthy fins drop down as shapes and spikes during a fire escaping from any floor window. It's scary. Uh, I believe all these are add-ons by the uh, building management and uh, this will be under the jurisdiction of Fire Services Act, whereby all designated building owners are actually responsible for the fire safety of the occupants and firefighters. Okay, we miss out firefighters a lot. In fact, uh, when you design uh, uh, any buildings, you've got to take the firefighters uh, 
safety into consideration. That's why they look at structure safety so much because they are the one that's going to spend hours in the building where everybody's running out. Okay. To take, I think uh, this is uh, beyond, uh, because when a building is approved, I'm quite sure new building, there's no uh, such fins there. So the owner will have to actually take that responsibility. Next, anonymous attendee, no name. For the UBBC pipe penetrating through firefighting lobby, corridor will be concealed with fire seal. A bomber was not accepting this due to the material itself is not fire rated. How can I address this? If you actually uh, apply proper fire stop, that is being approved by fire authority, it should be acceptable unless it's makeshift fire, fire seal. There are a lot of makeshift fire seal on construction site. I've seen too many. No, all these you cannot use. Let's say if the architect leave an opening in the riser duct for trunking, cables, pipings of, let's say, six feet by 18 inches, I mean, contractor cannot use cement and sand to cast it down to a few inches. No. You know very well that cement and sand cannot last in a real fire. So you've got to use proper fire stopping system. So as, as architect, you need to make sure that proper uh, tested fire protection system, passive wise, is being uh, installed and not for cost saving. All right. Yeah, uh, Tay, perhaps I'll add on to that one also. Uh, the UBBL actually does specify very clearly uh, what is the maximum size of non-combustible penetrations uh, or combustible penetrations that is allowed through uh, these uh, these fire walls or compartment walls? And it also, when it says fire stopping, it actually requires a fire stop that can seal up that hole. Yes. Yeah. So yes. so it is not just a fire seal. Uh, it really has to be an intermittent fire stop. Uh, with the two collars and one that will expand and specify to the right diameter so that when the intermittent seal expands, the inner ring will compress and strangle the pipe and seal up the opening. Uh, all these specifications and products are widely available out there. Yeah, they are, they are uh, people from Promac, people from Hilti in particular, uh, manufactures each one of these products and they are tested to serve its particular purpose. So, yeah, uh, the bomber officer is probably correct in saying that, oh, okay, that PVC pipe cannot penetrate through the wall. Uh, but what the actual response is that you have to have the correct fire seal yeah, into that wall. Yeah, that, that, yeah so, sorry. Uh, they had no, no, I think, uh, thank you. Thank you for the uh, elaboration on that. And uh, as I say, is that all the system must be tested uh, and approved by fire rescue department. I'm quite sure in this case that is being raised by anonymous attendee. Uh, they are they are using a makeshift mm. because if you use plastic pipe, especially for floors, now walls is not so crucial. Floors I've seen uh, fire collars being installed on the wrong side, on the upper uh, surface of the floor. Yeah. All the fire collars should be installed below because yes. that's where where you want to stop the fire coming through. If you install on the top, by the time the uh, collar activates, it's too late. Fire already went through. And nowadays, we use so many uh, PVC pipes. They melt and they burn. Okay, so you need to have... It's not a fire seal. You need to have a fire stop, fire stopping system. You're talking about system. It's no more just one material. You cannot use a, a, a acrylic seal or whatever. No, you need a proper fire system. And if you were to test it to a BSEN standard, Normally, you'll be acceptable by the fire authority, all right? And you need also C1, C2, C3, architect got the sign at the end. Let's look at the next one. Is there any regulations of standards on the sizing of water supply pipe that serve the hydrant? Of course. These are actually, uh, you'll be designed by the uh, engineers depending on the length of the piping and on the flow rate and uh, distance from the building. Uh, this will not normally be carried out by the architects, but you have to refer to the mechanical electrical engineer consultants. Uh, all the, uh, uh, what do you call that, the wet fire protection systems that actually uh, comes with hydraulic calculation, including sprinkler, wet riser, hose reel, 
they all have their calculations. All right. Except are that. Um, yeah, there are a few more. Oops, I think we sort of jumped the uh, the the line now. Oh dear, I don't know which is the one that's yeah. coming after now. Okay, there is uh, one in the front here, another anonymous attendee. Thank you for the great presentation. Do you need a horizontal fire barrier for high rise condos to prevent fire from spreading sideways? For any building, not only for high rise condos, as long as you've got a compartment walls or separating walls with penetrations, that means services going through, or if you have an opening for people to uh, assess, you need proper fire, passive fire protection system. For openings, for people to access from one compartment to the other, you need a fire door or a, roller, a fire rated roller shutter. Or if you have uh, services, pipes, cables, trunkings, passing through a compartment wall, separating wall, you then need proper tested and approved fire barrier system. Okay. Hi, out of curiosity, Adeline Chan from Penang. Hi, out of curiosity, question one, what is the opinion of KL118 in terms of fire safety? Well, I think it's high enough for people with parachute on the floor 118. Uh, I'm not sure where they can land, maybe in the Klang Valley. I'm in the, I've, I'm no, no objection on high rise because now this has become a, a competition uh, for iconic buildings in the world. And thank goodness, the uh, highest tower, Jeddah Tower of Saudi Arabia, one kilometer has been uh, stopped. That, that leave Butch Khalifa still the tallest. And uh, if you think KL118 is the tallest, you just wait for a few more years. There'll be another one that's coming up that's going to be higher than 118. Okay. I'm not, I cannot uh, tell you uh, whether it's safe or not uh, until I study what has been done. But one thing is for sure the refuge floor concept is still not being uh, accepted in Malaysia. I would like to uh, advise for all the architects that's involved in high rise that you need to actually help to promote this particular uh, concept because nobody can actually walk down 118 floors. Go and think about it, okay? So what are you, it's not just providing staircase, working out the, the, the egress width according to the floor density. Come on, you've got to think about human beings. Do, can you, even for yourself, if you are like me, we climb hills and mountains. I can, but what about the rest? And even I can, the front, the people who are in, in front of me, if they're slow, what can I do? So the, uh, it's very, very dangerous to uh, look at a high-rise building of that height and declare it very, very safe until, uh, of course, subsequently probably to come up with an evacuation program assisted I always say assisted evacuation program. And I was told that KL118 actually already built in a leaf evacuation system. I actually have an interesting uh, conversation uh, with an IEM uh, guy. And he thought that there's a build first building in Malaysia that's adopting leaf. I said, no. 20 years ago, KL, KL Tower, Petronas Tower already do that. And then the second building in Malaysia that did that using lift, high-speed lift for evacuation is KL Communication Tower. So if this one adopts it, it's actually the third. But you have to remember, it's not free for all, for the public. It has to be managed. And that means it actually go, is more complex than just a concept, all right? Question number two, very interested to know what and how fire safety is being assessed and applied for this kind of super high rise. This is only the tip of the iceberg. You have not heard everything yet, okay? Uh, there are so much information, so much knowledge to share, and there are a lot of uh, lessons learned from uh, whatever that's happening uh, around the world. And I think uh, networking, I think, is now uh, um, essential, and essential for uh, professionals. Because if you were to just cook up in Malaysia, you just imagine, what kind of information will you be receiving? You need to open up yourself, link up uh, so that at least you get first-hand information. 
I'm very, very active in LinkedIn. If you link up with me, you receive all the first aid information around the world. All right, I already got about 15,000. Uh, a lot of people is joining me. There are a lot of professionals right inside there. And if you have a technical problem, you just ask. And I can tell you, you get a lot of free advice and consultation. Of course, you don't have to accept all of them, but at least people are willing to help. So, open up uh, and uh, there's no box. No only thing outside the box, no box. You go to Elenio. If you've seen the board living building, broad living building, that is 100% stainless steel. How would you advise on the fire safety design while maintaining the design concept? Broad living building. I have not this, seen it. Uh, this one is the recent uh, uh, Chinese oh. company. They manufacture the modular building using stainless steel components. Okay. And uh, and it's uh, they can erect the building on site in in I think ten hours or something like that. <laughs> yeah. I I don't think I have any objection to any innovative building design, but the one thing you could start thinking is that the what kind of compartmentation can a stainless steel provide? If they have let's say infills uh, for compartmentation walls to prevent heat transfer. With no radiation, then fine. Otherwise, metals actually radiate heat. You can go and find out different metals, what kind of a heat radiation index are you looking at? Because radiation out of conduction, convection, and radiation, radiation is the most scared, most scared, uh, what are call uh, factors in causing fire propagation. You must always remember that. That's why I always against a uh, roller shutter that's not insulated. Imagine a piece of metal 20 feet by 10 feet that radiate heat when you got a fire behind it. If you stand in front of it and if you can last there for five minutes, I'll buy you a, a breakfast. Okay? No. You've got to understand all these are fundamental physics and we already forgotten. You know, taught to us by all our teachers. Yok Chun Liao, nowadays architect designs, architectural designs are getting very complex and complicated. There are many new and high-tech buildings products being specified. Do you think it's time that fire engineers require to provide the expertise to prepare a mandatory fire report prior to building? Uh, actually, this concept is already uh, carried out in a lot of other foreign countries. We call it the fire engineers uh, engagement during prelim stage with the uh, architect to conduct a fire risk assessment. After that, the fire safety strategy in terms of design will be formulated. And then only the normal architect will be, only architect will then be asked to provide detailed designs. So uh, fire engineers actually, uh, the one that can actually see all the risks. Now imagine once a building is completed, it's impossible to actually incorporate a lot of uh, safety if you find that there are flaws. So definitely there's a lot of prospect uh, in this particular area. And I would also like to uh, mention that recently there's a breakthrough in BIM, all right? And uh, now BIM can also incorporate, uh, what do you call that? Uh, fire uh, dynamics in their, in their design. So you can actually test the uh, design uh, virtually, whether it's sufficient, insufficient, robust or not. So this is actually a breakthrough and I think BIM will be the future with the 5G, 6G is coming on, all right? And Kenji, in terms of refuge floor, I've seen a protected compartment concept for physical challenge to safely hide and wait for rescue. Uh, what are your thoughts? Uh, no, no. It's not supposed, refuge floors are not supposed to be a floor to wait for people to rescue because nobody's going to come to for your rescue. You still need to walk down the staircase and get yourself out of the building ASAP. Uh, the only uh, difference is that you can sort of recuperate yourself temporarily, you know, and then, uh, of course, you have to move along. But as I pointed out that we need to start looking at phase evacuation. We do not need to for everybody to get out of the building because it's silly. So the management, whenever the uh, advanced detection system pick up a, a signal, they should send their guys to go investigate whether it's a full-scale fire or is it a false alarm. If, it's a full, if it is a, a fire during the incipient stage by using extinguisher, they can put it out. Then they can delay the mass evacuation. So everybody can work, still carry on working happily. But if it is a fire, then probably the 10 floors above the floor on fire need to actually be evacuated, leaving the rest still working. 
unless the fire gets out of control. By that time, I think the firefighters will be on, on site and then they can decide whether to do that or not. So at the moment, we are still actually, uh, the whole world is in too, too extreme. In London, why there's 72 people die because they have a stay put policy since pre-war until the incident happened. Their policy for fire brigades, if there's a fire, everybody go back to their, their apartment, lock themselves out and wait for firefighter to come and rescue them. Never happened because the staircase has already been compromised. In Malaysia, whenever there's alarm, everybody get out. Also, I think these are too extreme. We need to look for a, a, what to call a intermediate, more practical solution for mass evacuation or phase evacuation, as I pointed out. We should not be just go for either because that's the easier solution. Lock yourself up, stay up, wait for us, or just get out of the building. No, I think we need to look at the conditions where the fire happened. Then we can then go into assessment of how safe is your, is your building. Do you achieve one star, two star, three star, four star? And then do you have people to actually handle the emergency? How well are they equipped? How well are they actually uh, be trained? So there are a lot of factors to be considered before this strategy can be matured, but we, we can start uh, thinking now, okay? Uh, in developed countries like UK and Australia, it's still common for modern buildings to have external exposure by staircases, how can this be adopted in Malaysia as, it's, as it is still a general norm for Bomba to only accept compartmentally fire? No, that's not true. You can still have ventilated, naturally ventilated, uh, what do you call, fire escape staircase. And uh, as I say, it's up to the uh, architects to design, but I found a lot of so-called ventilated, naturally ventilated uh, fire escape staircase that's not pressurized, they will leave the smallest opening. Not only that, afraid that the rainwater will come in and wet the landing, they put up a window there and they have the window open only very, very slightly. This is not naturally ventilated, okay? So there are a lot of uh, misinterpretation of the word naturally ventilated. When the bylaw says you need to provide opening means unobstructed opening. You can then provide certain cover uh, on top to make sure that uh, whenever there's a smoke from the floor, it can still be ventilated and let uh, people uh, escape safely without uh, you know, compromising the integrity of the staircase. Any more questions? Uh, I think there's, um, actually there's quite, quite a few that we may not be able to cover. Uh, I think we should be able to answer it and then we'll email it back to the um, okay uh, to Pam. Uh. But yeah. I think there's one uh, one came through. Uh, let's say if we go to the um, um I, I don't know if what okay, I here, see here, on the here, screen here. I saw it. what you see. Yeah, Kai Louis. Fire escape for people yeah. with disabilities or yeah, who right, need yeah. assistance to escape is always a concern for buildings more than two story. How do you go about this? From point A, main door to staircase and lastly final discharge points. Uh, as I pointed out, if you are talking about people with a uh, uh, wheelchair or people on clutches, they are actually instruments to actually help them to uh, go down the staircase, but these are only allowed for low-rise buildings, probably below six stories. Okay? But if you are looking at high-rise buildings, definitely no. The proposal will be for all these people to be pre-identified during emergency, they should be uh, collected by the uh, floor marshal of each floor to uh, the uh, specific fireman's leave for evacuation to leave. And I have not even talked about uh, healthcare facility yet. Huh? I got a full paper on healthcare facility in terms of design, in terms of the issue, challenges, and all that. I tell you, it's unthinkable. So I make sure that I maintain very healthy and preventing myself from entering into a hospital. Yes, okay. Yeah, uh, perhaps you would like to answer just one, uh, let's go through just one last question and then the okay. rest of it, guys, uh, we will answer it by putting in an email and sending it back to all the participants. Okay, uh, okay is there is the one last one here with regards anonymous to... Anonymous uh, uh, No, uh, that's... the. Um, um, okay, one by Y Kyung, uh, Ng Y Kyung, um, 12, 12.31 p.m. I don't know if the order I see it here is the same as your order. 
it will be uh, the second, uh, wait, uh. the second latest. Okay, Wai uh, Kiong. Um, um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, thank you for a great presentation and explain some of the latest understanding and thinking for safety and fire engineering. It makes what we are doing now seem so inadequate. So how much value are there in what we are doing now under the existing standards? Are we wasting our time and need to re-engineer the whole process? Uh, what I'm saying is that uh, there are more things to learn and uh, you've got to get out of your nutshell. Uh, and learn more things. And that's why CPD is actually very, very important. But then CPD is only once in a while. I still think that if you can uh, network with people with the knowledge, then I think it'd be very much better. And uh, not forgetting that if you are a PSP, you virtually sign and declare that the building design is safe. Okay? I think you all want to go and think about that. It's not just signing your signature. You know? Better read the small prints. So then the question, of course, you can ask is that, do I do enough? Is it sufficient? Did I check the, all the systems? In the past, I've actually uh, looked at uh, specification for fire doors. I list down so many I collected from the market from various uh, architectural companies. <coughs> Friendly speaking, one of it scared the shit out of me. It merely have one sentence. Okay, I will share with you and you can think about whether that is the fire door that you're going to get. In the aspect of this architectural company, it says all fire doors supply for this project shall be in accordance with the manufacturer's specification. Stop. What do you think? If we give you a, a, a paper carton fire door, you also got to accept, you know, that is the aspect. You never talk about testing, you never talk about approval, you never talk about what you want. You give the owners for them to give you what you want. Oh my goodness. So I'm sure a lot of architecture company, their specification library has not been reviewed and renewed for the last 10, 15 years. I've seen also architects uh, specification, quoted Malaysian standard that is already obsolete. We already removed it years ago, still appear. So how do you expect the door people to give you a door specified according to a standard that is no more there? So I think there are a lot of homework will still need to be uh, uh, carried out by architects. I call this a de-learning and relearning period. It's very, very crucial because as some of you pointed out, we are getting very complex and complicated. Have we even done enough to look at the, uh, what I call the, uh, Building materials property. Do we know how they behave in terms of thermal conductivity, in terms of density, in terms of subjecting to so many different kinds of environment? If not, then how are you going to actually look at fire safety design? So it's not whether uh, what you are doing is of value or not. No. That question, I think you have to go and look at it yourself. Have you done enough? That's what I meant. Have you done enough to upgrade yourself to a level where uh, competency is now actually a, a very big word and the whole world is talking about it? Just log into any of the uh, international uh, uh, website, you'll find that it's now become so important, especially if you are designated with the responsibility of submitting a plan to be constructed by developer and contractors. And it's going to be eventually occupied by occupants. Are you happy that the risk inside this particular building is actually all looked after? Or at least be prepared and ready to face any fire incident to minimize the risk of exposure of all the occupants? If not, then you need to actually put in more effort in that. Forget about your Facebook and all that, okay? Your Instagram and uh, what? Get involved in LinkedIn. That's where you learn. And it's free. That's what I like. It's free. You get a lot of free information every day. And then I, I go into my, my LinkedIn every day. That's why I learn so much because life is a never-ending learning process. The day you stop learning is the day you retire. 
Okay, so if you have still have not actually picked up anything new for the last 10 years, the whole world is progressing so fast, you'll be left behind, so far behind. All right. Okay. Well, uh, th thank you so much, uh, Engineer Tay, for, for your time. We are over short by 10 minutes now. Uh, in closing, I would just say that yes, for all the questions that uh, uh, has not been answered, uh, we will we will endeavor to put in the email, and I'll we will hand it back to uh, to the uh, to Pam, and uh, and I'll, I'm sure they'll find a way to disseminate it to all the participants. Huh? Uh, in closing, perhaps I'll I'll just take a few seconds, and I'll just say that uh, uh, we've always approached. The, the UBBL in the line of our work and say, oh, we're going to use the UBBL. We got to use the UBBL. What are you? How how do we use the UBBL and how do we use, how how do we uh, de, how do we interpret the UBBL? Now, I I like to back to defer. Um, we are the architects and we are the engineers and we are the creators of the the the, the building. We are the we are the people who create our new built environment. Uh, the UBBL is really just a set of, uh, uh, it, it's actually just a law. The UBBL is just a summary of the things, all the things that you have to do. And it gives you, it turns it into a law so that uh, the minimum uh, the minimum standards can be applied. You know, when you do things according to the law, it is deemed to comply. But really, as the professionals, we are the custodian of the law. We are the custodians of all the standards that you see out there. Who wrote all these standards? These standards and bylaws were all written by people in the industry, like Tae Hyo Gyang, well, to a little bit of extent myself, and all the other people in the industry. So uh, we are not the users of the bylaw. Rather, we are the custodians of the bylaw. It is The onus is on us to fully understand it. And the onus is on us to look at the adequacies of the standards that we have and to have a continuous set of improvements to it, yeah? to contribute into the development of new standards and revisions to the bylaw. Uh, and the beneficiaries of all this are, of course, the real end users, the people who are using the buildings and the places that we have designed for them. Yeah, and I think I'll, I'll, I'll put that into closing. So again, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, Hao Giang, it's always a pleasure. Yeah, welcome. Thank you okay, thank, thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, see you again. Soon. Yeah, bye.